thank you both for inviting me, and uh, thank you all for, for being here. Um, I don't actually intend to start the workshop off on a negative note. That's why I put a question mark at the end there. And as you'll see during the talk, I don't think, think the intersection of this stuff is the end of privacy. However, it could be, right? Uh, especially if you read a lot of dystopian science fiction like I do. It's fairly clear that the future trajectory of these modern technologies uh, could be pretty awful uh, if we don't proactively try to, try to deal with things. Before starting, I wanted to thank some people, normally put acknowledgments at the end, but um, I'll do the usual. If I say anything insightful or interesting, it's because of these people. Um, uh, I'm relatively new to the privacy uh, space in more than a passing way. Um, Peter uh, Swire, in particular, uh, has uh, him and I have chatted a lot this summer. We're teaching a class. He's teaching a class on policy uh, and security in the spring, and I'm going to be uh, working with him in the class, co-teaching it, because we want to uh, focus on Internet of Things and augmented reality as sort of a topic domain. Um, other folks, Franzi, uh, Rob Chang at Qualcomm that I've talked to specifically about the talk, and then a bunch of people at Microsoft, um, uh, like Dave, uh, from both uh, a year and a half ago when I spent a summer there and uh, more recently. Uh, so uh, a lot of the stuff in my thinking on this is relatively in process, but uh, it's not really all me. So me, uh, as Yoshi said, I've been working in augmented reality for a long time. Um, and, you know, the augmented reality community in general hasn't really done much uh, interesting or, or, or detailed in the world of privacy, although it's this constant subtext, right? So even going back to work that took place at Columbia and I was there uh, in the late 90s, uh, where we were looking at privacy from a... a uh, mostly from a collaborative sense and a, a user sense. I don't, I'm working with you, and I don't want you to necessarily see everything I'm doing. But from a privacy security sense, where I might not uh, want the system or the computer or people outside to see things, we really haven't thought too much about that. Um, but it is this, this subtext that goes on. And so uh, some of the things we've been thinking about, uh, we've been uh, thinking about this for, for a bit. I've also been heavily involved in the Ubicomp work at Georgia Tech, uh, we created this, this building called the Aware Home years ago uh, where we looked at uh, what you could do in a house if you could put tons of technology in it, right? So there was a lot of work on things like uh, aging in place, how do you support people living independently longer. Um, the digital family portrait was an interesting example of that. Um, the interesting thing here is that there was a lot of work in, in people thinking about wh what you collect, how you disseminate it, how you show it. Um, the DFP in particular tried to walk this line between uh, providing support for distant relatives of people who, who are trying to live alone, uh, elderly folks, um, and so gave sort of a, a, a sort of subtle uh, overview of their activity through these butterflies in the edge of a picture frame, but didn't give detailed information, right? Now, of course, in this project, the, the detailed information was all there in the home and could be accessed, uh, and so as we move forward and, and try to make these technologies more real, we need to deal with that. But it, it was this, this theme through a lot of work. Um, lately, and uh, it may seem unrelated, but I've been doing a lot of work in games. I teach, I'm teaching a video game design class right now. Um, and a lot of work in AR games. Now, at the top and bottom videos there, the, the games were on little tabletop markers because that's really all we can do right now, right, in a real sense. So the bottom game, Nerd Herder, is in the App Store. You could buy it, or not, you download it, it's free. The middle game uh, uh, is much more interesting from a future sense. So this was uh, a real AR implementation of an interactive drama called Facade uh, that Michael Matias and Andrew Stern at CMU did. And so we made a real big full room version. We built an apartment, mapped it into the world. And this kind of actually corresponds to one of the trajectories of the future of entertainment in the home, right? And if you think about what a drama like that would need, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, uh, it, it causes problems if we want to uh, have really secure access to a lot of information, a better environment. Okay? So, so why, why now? Why here? Why am, I, why am I here? Why am I thinking about this sort of stuff? since I've been building games and things for a long time. So one side of it is that uh, back in 2008, 2009, I, I, a lot of my work is on building tools for designers and people to use uh, to try to do AR. We started working on a web-based version of this system called Argon, and we're stumbling through version 3 right now. Um, 
But Argon's web-based, and the idea is you can write independent web pages with transparent backgrounds, and they stack. So you can have multiple things in the same space. But this immediately exposes all kinds of new privacy and security uh, issues, much like some of them like you would have with the web, right? So what does clickjacking mean in an in a AR environment? Um, but some of them are just uh, uh, other things, like if one system is doing tracking in a space and the other one uh, doesn't know about that information, do we want to share it? How do we share it? How do we get information? So we're sort of thinking about that stuff through the years and, and not making a ton of progress on it um, until actually a couple of summers ago when, when uh, I, I met David and uh, saw some of their work. And, and so uh, it's clear that this is a huge issue and, and we don't know the answers to it yet. Um, the other thing that happened was, was uh, that um, wearables arrived, and we had this interesting reaction in the, in the public of, okay, there's glass, and now all of a sudden a bunch of people were really bent out of shape about it, right? And why? Um, and it's clear that there's sort of some reactionary stuff, but some of it is, uh, has to do with people being completely unaware of the stuff that's available about them on the internet and how easy it is to get at it, and the tight loop feedback you can get on a wearable system, not a wearable camera, right, so it's not a GoPro, uh, all of a sudden foregrounds all this stuff that people could know about you in, a, in, a, in an immediate way, and this kind of freaks people out. Um, so I, that got me more interested, especially in the context of Argon. The other thing that happened was, was lots of sensing. So uh, Microsoft is a bunch of people uh, working in, in David's group, leverages this stuff, doing uh, projector camera pairs so that you can augment and track in a huge space with multiple connects. Um, but in the mobile space, which is where I work, things have gotten really interesting. So this is a, a video of Google Tango, uh, where th they're building as they walk around a space, a highly detailed, textured 3D model of a huge space that they're walking through. And if we think about that um, and how that information could be used, which is awesome uh, for someone like me, but uh, from a privacy perspective, it's, it's really, really scary. Okay, so... So that kind of is where I, I started thinking about this problem and, and what is the problem? What, 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 are, what am I worried about? Okay. So up till now in the Ubicom sense, there's been lots of little bits of information out there, right? So if you go back through Ubicom and look at work, say, that Shwedek Patel has done with HydroSense and before that with the electric um, uh, uh, Zensi stuff that they did at Georgia Tech, uh, we can infer tons of information from very, very noisy uh, uh, signals, right? So if I can sense your water and your electricity in your house, I know tons about you. Um, uh, so that's fine, it was research, but then these things become real products. And then we have all these other things like fitness trackers and electric thermostats like the Nest and TVs that are sending all the information about what you're watching out into the world. Toilets that are going to start analyzing everything you're watching, I don't know. Um, and then medical devices and all these things, right? So in the aware home, uh, we had cameras everywhere, and one of the things we did with them was gate detection to try to detect uh, when people are starting to have physical mobility problems, right? You can, if you have fine-grained cameras, you can do stuff like uh, detect early onset of Alzheimer's, or not Alzheimer's, sorry, um, the other one, uh, Parkinson's, thank you, uh, uh, just by, over time, watching uh, for the changes in hand tremors. But that implies a huge amount of information. People haven't worried too much about it because this stuff's all relatively separate. Like, why would I care that, that uh, Fitbit has, has all my step counts, right? It's just step counts. Um, why do I don't care if Samsung has my TV information. But of course, that's changing, right? And so more recently, Nest has, and, and Google and other people are, are pushing this thread program. Uh, uh, Qualcomm and other people in the all join uh, community of create the all Seen alliance where they're trying to create a community of people sharing information apple introduced homekit so all of a sudden now you step back and think wow well it's not just my steps or my this or my that they could all be collected together all be processed together and then oh wait maybe we're going to have tangos on our faces right it's not just a camera like glass it's it's real depth sensing i have now a full 3d model of all of you because i've looked at all of you and I can tell what you're wearing, if you look tired, maybe, I don't know. And if you look at the Connect 2 and what it can sense about you in terms of your heart rate, uh, muscle tension, and so on, just from video processing, uh, it becomes kind of odd to think about what this potential future could be. 
Um, as an example of what you can sense, if you can start bringing these different sensors together, this is a project uh, also at Microsoft that Andy Wilson uh, and uh, Hrvoja Benko did. Uh, it's called Cross Motion, and they've taken uh, a Kinect camera and the sensors, the accelerometers on the phone, and they're time synchronized. And now, by simply running in real time a optical flow off over the entire depth image, they can match the flow of pixels to that acceleration of the phone and find the phone. They don't even have to be able to see the phone, right? They just have to be able to see something that has similar, similar uh, uh, motion. So the phone is in his pocket now. He can still find it, um, and so on. And if you think about what this means, right, especially if all this stuff's going off to the cloud, and uh, I, I love that, yeah. Um, if all this stuff's going off to the cloud uh, and, and could be processed at leisure, you know, what, what can we start learning, right? Well, so the extreme, of course, is someone could be creating a real-time recreation in 3D of everything, right? You, if you have all this information, if you can build dynamic 3D models that are, that are changing over time and you have all this identity information, so on and so forth. You could, this is Sony's, this is just an image I found in the net of, of one online VR, but it, it isn't out of the question, right? So that's what I mean by this would be the end of privacy, right? If that world existed, then we're, you, and people had access to it, they could go in and find out lots of interesting things. Of course, none of us really think this is gonna happen. Right, because how are all these things going to be collected together? How could it be all synchronized? It's not really that likely. Um, maybe it is. Uh, you know, we're all a bunch of people were surprised at uh, this little event uh, that happened. I'm not going to talk more about this, and it, it isn't really important on which side of this line any of us fall on, uh, how we feel about this. But in the technical community, um, it also uh, uh, is interesting. I think. The big data world, the, the, the people who are interested in processing lots of data are really excited about Internet of Things, right? Because it allows us to find lots of information out that we can mine and, and do fun things with, whether you're academics or if you're, if you're in the business community. So I'm going to pick on Bob uh, because he's not here. Um, uh, he gave a talk, an opening keynote. He's a, uh, he was a journalist. He's also the startup lead on Offset at Rackspace. And he gave a talk at this augmented reality business conference called AWE. And when I saw it, I was like, just sort of sitting there going, wow, this really captures the, the gestalt feeling of what a lot of people in, in the startup space think, right? So he's super excited because context, uh, all this context that's available, and he was talking specifically about 3D cameras and Tango and synchronizing it with stuff as I've been talking about. It's going to let us create highly personalized content that can be like really delivered to. And as he says, you'll be tracked, but it's okay because you'll get benefit. Right? And that may be true, um, you know, but he's really pushing, talking about the business side. It's like, yeah, they'll be tracked and it's going to be awesome for your business because you'll be able to see everything about everybody, which lets you know a lot of stuff, right? In fact, you'll have, you know, then deep, deep insights into your customers. And if you think about all this information, imagine what insights people have if they could access what you're doing in your home, how, how you use things, when you do stuff. Uh, it actually starts sounding pretty pretty creepy. So he did spend uh, about 30 seconds at the end of his talk talking about privacy. Um, the video's online. Uh, you probably can't, can't read that, but I could share, share it with you. I actually just grabbed these screenshots from the video. Um, you know, so he brought privacy, and I thought it was interesting and, and revealing. So I, I transcribed some of what he said. Um, you know, he basically said most people are really freaked out about, about this. And... Uh, and when I tell them that this brave new world's coming and they're going to be surveilled in their car and their home and the shopping centers and so on, you know, he says, soon we're going to have all these 3D sensors that are watching us everywhere, uh, watching our li us live our lives, and we're going to be able to do all these cool things for you, right? Uh, and his closing comment was, or in this section was kind of one that, that struck me. It's, he says he's already noticed a new kind of digital divide, not between, between rich and poor, although obviously if you're, you're poor you can't buy these technologies, but between people who are like completely all in. So he's proud that he's all in. All his information is off in the cloud. Everything about him is, is joined together and it's a wonderful brave new world for him. Um, and people who are all out. So not kind of out, just all out. I don't want anything known about me at all, which is a really weird kind of... Um, 
way to, to look at this, right? Do we have to be all in or all out? Can't we be kind of sort of in, right? And when I talk to people about these technologies, at some point, even people who are really positive about it, they're like, yeah, I get great benefit from these services. But, oh yeah, of course, I want to be able to say, no, that data you can't have. But with the way the structure of these systems, like the Fitbits and the, the home tech, there's no partial. It's all, either all in or all out, right? And it's getting harder to opt out, right? As, as every appliance, every device, everything that you buy is internet connected, depending on how those architectures are set up, you may not be able to opt out. Or you may not, you may, your choice may be, do I have a microwave or do I let Nest know what I'm cooking, right? Is that, is that the only choices we want to give people? I mean, obviously, I don't think so, and I suspect nobody in this room thinks that that's the choice we want to give people. So there's a bunch of problems um, that we could uh, uh, talk about. Um, so one of them is, is this, this problem where everything is going to the cloud. So up till now, a lot of these services have gone into the cloud by default because that's what you can do, right? If you're going to build a Fitbit, the idea of building this distributed system where your data is in your phone and then maybe it goes up and it has to be synchronized. We have all this, you know, if you've done distributed systems and worried about federated uh, uh, updates of, of possibly conflicting data, it would be a nightmare. It's better just send it up to the cloud and let it all sit there, have one master. Um, but that's really bad for privacy, right? It's, as we tell our kids when they get on Facebook or they're or doing whatever, it's like, Anything you put anywhere in the digital space is out there forever, right? There's no pulling it back. And the same is true for that, right? So 10 years from now, will it matter if all our step counts were in the Fitbit? I don't know, but it might. And uh, we don't have a choice right now, okay? Um, so in some sense, I, I mentioned HomeKit, the Thread uh, uh, Alliance, the all Seeing Alliance. In some sense, these things don't go far enough, in my opinion. HomeKit, in particular, is designed to let you control all these technologies with your iOS devices. But it doesn't really say anything about where the data lives, who uh, has access to it, and so on. Um, hopefully, I actually uh, hope that, you know, whether it's one of these systems or say, uh, like Home OS or one of the other uh, systems out there, we will get to the point where there is actually a system that helps us manage this data in a more holistic way. Right, so um, uh, with the idea of trying to keep as much of this data out of the cloud as possible, I may be very happy to let a processed anonymized version of my data go up to the cloud, but I may be less happy about, about the details. Um, when Facebook bought Moves, how many people have used Moves um, or know about Moves? Okay, so Moves was a, uh, it's a little app, you can buy it, download it. And it's kind of Fitbit on steroids. So it, it both uses the phone to track your movement, and then it infers things. It's like, you know, it infers where you are, what you're doing. You can tag things. And then over time, it's like, oh, you, it can infer if you're driving or walking or riding your bike based on the motion uh, uh, and so on. So it's kind of cool. Um, those high bits of I was at the office or at the shopping center or at home, eh, maybe I'd be willing to share that with Facebook. Fine. But you actually are sharing like all that detailed information, right? And that's where I see an interesting line as being. How can we control what's shared and so on? So Rob, uh, Rob's uh, uh, Chanduk is a uh, uh, SVP uh, at Qualcomm, uh, heavily involved in, in All Join and the All Seen Alliance. Uh, he wrote this article on Medium that he pointed me at, um, which uh, I thought had an interesting title. So he, he talks about we need to move between from, from system on a chip to system on a net. So can we start thinking about systems within the home, for example, that, that uh, do things for us and share data in a tight, high-performance way, which we need for things like augmented reality, right? I can't augment people unless this information is being shared at high precision with high data rates. But can we start worrying, thinking about architectures that, that really respect locality of reference, right? So that if... Something's happening on my phone and your phone. We'll have tight communication, but the rest of you don't see it, and it doesn't go out of here, and so on. So these are hard, hard problems, right? But I think if we want to be able to offer the services that we want to offer, 
if you walk around Ubicomp and look at the kind of things people are proposing, are doing, uh, and so on, look back through the history, we need lots of rich information, but it really f conflicts with privacy. I actually, um, when I was reading this and thinking about it lately, it's like chips are really cheap, right? A little SOC like the, you know, Apple's A7 or A8 or whatever it is in the iPhone 6, they're like a couple of bucks. So why actually couldn't we imagine a future where Internet of Devices is not uh, just communication ID and a bit of data flow, why couldn't every device have a computer in it and uh, the federated home that you have would wake up and say, hey, is anybody in charge? No, nobody's in charge. All right, I'm in charge. And, and then start providing real complex tangible services that, uh, that you could uh, uh, leverage and then start providing interfaces and so on. People work on this in research, uh, uh, but uh, it would be one way forward, right, where you don't have to buy the box that sits in the corner of your room. Um, anyway, so, of course, that's not enough. So uh, a lot of what uh, David's group uh, and Franzi and other people have, have done, and, and we may hear more about it later today, has to do with that sort of next level of question where if, you know, we're sharing this data for some AR thing, do we actually want the apps that we're running, do we trust them? Do we want them to get access to this information? Which is the whole next level of, of, of question, and it's actually a much harder problem. So uh, the surround web stuff that happened at Microsoft took this, I almost imagine as one end of the spectrum, right? It's like we're going to try to make it as secure as possible so that the apps get as little information about the world, structure, semantics, whatever. Um, they get some th abstract things like surfaces, is this a vertical surface, a horizontal surface, is this thing near, near something else I care about? Um, uh, and so they developed, and I encourage you to go read some of the, the work, they developed uh, ideas of, of um, having room skeletons that are abstracted, having uh, uh, detection take place where the systems don't actually know uh, what's being detected and how it's working, uh, just the, that something happens. So I think it's, it's really interesting uh, work. If you think, of course, about the stuff that I was talking about, like the games and, and things, uh, it, it is good for a set of applications, but because you're not giving rich 3D information, uh, certain kinds of semantic information, it's hard to do certain apps. Now, when I, when I think about it, when I teach augmented reality design classes, when I'm working with students, they propose lots of things. It's like, it'd be great to have AR that does whatever. And uh, they get tired of my first question, which is, why AR? Why are we doing this in AR? Why should this information be in the world? Yes, it's cool. Right? It's awesome that I can use the walls for display, that I can put my calendar up on the wall, but is that the right way to do this? And, and there's this balance, this question of, um, for the kind of apps that really matter in AR, where they're tightly integrated with things in the world, um, such that uh, there's real benefit to, to having it out there, cluttering up the world, being difficult to interact with, how do we, how do we manage that? Right? Um, so going back to the games work, uh, especially, again, the game uh, that I said with Air Facade. So Facade, uh, that's tr that was Trip. Trip and Grace Marriage Dissolving in Front of You. It's an awesome, uplifting experience. Uh, you can go download it, actually. It's a, the online version, it, or the PC. I encourage you to do it. Um, uh, so Trip will walk over behind the bar and start making a drink and ask, asking you if you want a drink. And so we did that in the, in the game, Trip, uh, in the room. So Trip would actually go behind the bar and do stuff. To do that, Trip needs to know where the bar is. He needs to know what a bar is. He needs to know what beverages you have in the bar because he offers you things that you might actually have. These are really detailed semantic things that if you wanted to build a rich interactive drama, you need information for. And these are the kind of things that get people excited about the future of AR, right? Especially AR in the home. When we showed people, so that, the middle one over there is an AR version of Quake on uh, the University of South Australia's campus, right? So they built a detailed model of the campus and shoved it into Quake, uh, and you could run around campus with a big, horrible thing on, uh, 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 playing a 3D game. This, and then the lower corner is a recent promo video from this company called Salon Technologies, where they're really mapping a detailed version of your environment and, and showing you uh, a game in it. So these are... Uh, oh, and then the upper one is, uh, uh, is it Dismal? Yeah, it is. It's uh, Connect Party. If you haven't played Connect Party, if you have a micro, if you have an Xbox with a Connect, especially if you have kids, that is actually the best, the best Connect game ever made. Um, 
And it's not really a game, it's a play space, but it's evocative also of the kind of things that we'll want to do. So they just, you know, the room fills up with lava or there's balloons that you can kick around. How you make games and experiences like that without giving information away to the, the game is, is a big hard question, right? So moving away from games, um, you know, what about things like education, the medical stuff I talked about in the aware home, uh, you know, uh, certain kinds of educational apps might be sensitive. You want to do, to learn about something, but you don't really want other people knowing about it. The top middle image was from a game some students of mine made where they were trying to figure out how to teach people how to properly use condoms. Uh, so it was aimed at, uh, uh, and it, you know, it's not that version of AR. It was aimed at, um, <laughs> that's what they wanted to do, but we're like, well, we just can't track that. Um, what they wanted to, uh, but what they, it was aimed at, at late teens, early 20s, people who would be uncomfortable about it. So we, we talked to people at the CDC that we know in the STD division. Um, and, uh, 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 but it, that's something that, you know, you may not want your house knowing that you're, you're trying to learn about. You may not want your parents knowing. Um, other medical stuff and, and things like maintenance, right? If I, if I want to go around and, and be able to do things to my house, in my house, know about it, I need more detailed information. Okay, and how to manage that is, is a hard question. I think it's really interesting. So another problem is, is actually expressing what the threat is, right? So when I talk about this to the InfoSec people at Georgia Tech, it's like, well, what's the threat model, right? And it's like, well, uh, privacy, right? Um, we don't know what the threat model is because it's not 10 years in the future when all this data has been collected and processed and now we look back and go, oh my God. Um, you know, I, I clipped uh, a Facebook comment from one of my friends where I was ranting about something to do with the iWatch and why would anybody, like, want to give all this information to Apple. Um, oh, sorry, the Apple Watch. Um, and his response, uh, he's a technologist, he's a professor in computer science, <coughs> was, you know, I've been sharing my stream for years, I get great benefits, I don't care, right? And the two likes are also uh, old white guys, um, just like me. And, and so that's fine. That's fine, people can make that choice and they know a lot about technology and they're informed. But, you know, do we have to get to a minority report where the government's collecting everything and actually proactively knowing everything that everybody's doing minus the whole weird, uh, thank you, weird precog thing. Um, but knowing, I mean, if you look at what people are trying to do in, in, in uh, uh, the, the computational perception, uh, big data world, it's like they're actually in a sense, trying to build the precogs, right? Trying to figure out what's going to happen based on what's going on. And so, uh, uh, do we have to get there before before people really worry about this? Uh, a lot of the stuff, you know, I'm touching on a bunch of things. People are going to be talking about this later today. Who know more a lot know a lot more about it than me. Policy and law. So Peter, uh, Peter and I are planning for this course we're teaching next next spring, and. Uh, uh, you know, the, the policy side of things is really interesting, right? Left unfettered, the Googles and Facebooks and, and Yahoos and probably Microsofts and Apples will, would love to leverage and process all this data. Uh, uh, you know, when you look at the difference between Europe and, and the U.S. right now, it's, it's striking. And uh, it may be that we need to have laws and, and policy and have people understand what policies they want in order to compel companies to build these complex technologies that don't just send everything up into the cloud. The final thing, because um, this also comes up a lot, is the business side, right? Everything, uh, we've got ourselves in this position where we give everything, companies give everything away for free, and then they track you, and they build models of you. And, and so you're actually selling yourself to get a free service like Facebook. Um, and then that model allows them to sell you stuff. To, to build models of you and, and offer you services like advertising. And uh, if we pull that away, if we prevent people from getting something for their free services, how are they going to survive, right? People are remarkably uh, trained at this point to expect everything for free. Um, and if, looking at the games world is actually instructive. So Free-to-play games have essentially destroyed, well, first mobile and the race to the bottom in pricing destroyed a lot of the game payment system. And then free sort of pulled the carpet out from under, under everybody's feet. Um, but free-to-play games aren't free, right? If, if you know somebody who plays, uh, uh, I don't know, Angry Birds Go in this case, um, Candy Crush, people might have heard of that. Um, 
I know people who've literally said to me, oh, I don't pay for games. So a, a parent of one of my uh, kids' friends is like, oh, no, we don't, we don't pay for games for the kids. They only get to play free-to-play games. And so I talked to him, and it turns out he spent like 30 or 40 bucks over, over a year on Candy Crush. Because, oh, it was that one level I couldn't get by, so I paid a little <laughs> bit of money, right? Would he have spent 30 or 40 bucks on Candy Crush a priori? No chance, right? And in the game space, it's actually kind of distasteful. They're leveraging this sort of addiction... Uh, gambling compulsion, or it's like, oh, okay, I need to do something. Um, and they really literally are upfront about focusing on that. If you go to talks at GDC about monetization, could we do that in this space, right? If uh, the service is, I'm going to download some file, and at some point they're like, hey, you know, we can make this happen a little bit faster, maybe twice as fast if you pay a penny, right? Be like, yes, I'll pay that penny. And I might pay that penny like, 20 times a day over the course of a month, and maybe I've spent 10 bucks at the end of the month. If I told you ahead of time, you're gonna have to pay 10 bucks a month to get free, get fast file downloads, people would be up in arms. Um, so I think the key is figuring out how you both pay, allow people to pay for value in the moment when it's valuable, uh, and then making a system, micropayments, whatever, where it's possible to do that. Okay, so I think there's a huge possibility here to revive some of this micropayment stuff. Uh, and uh, if, we can, if we can figure out how to integrate it with the systems, and then when you think about starting to put serious processing, starting to get things out of the clouds, there's opportunities to do, do some interesting things. Okay? So that's kind of it. Uh, I don't think privacy is dead, uh, but uh, how much of it is dead is really up to us. Uh, and us, I mean the Ubicomp community, wearables community, um, the big, big, big companies, right? So we can choose to build technologies and systems that respect privacy. I actually think part of uh, a blog post that I posted on this is that, at some point uh, a while ago, is that I think for some companies, uh, potentially Microsoft, Apple, companies that have actual products, sorry, Google, um, uh, they actually could um, uh, step forward and try to be the, the companies that, that actually offer services, sell things uh, without building models of you, right? Because their business models aren't dependent on that. And, and I think there's a, a, a great opportunity for that uh, if they want. So thank you.